give you some conceptual ideas that you will need to work out the mathematics for Young's double slit interference beyond just looking up formulas and <laughs> using the formulas you look up. And the key idea that you are going to be seeing more throughout the semester, actually, is the concept of phase. So that, oh, let me get this back. Concept of phase. How many of you here remember the word phase in a mathematical context? I don't mean phasing through walls. That's just uh, X, X men. Um, so um, someone who wasn't in my class, Kian, do you remember the word phase in a mathematical context? Okay. Uh, could could you people who remember the word phase in mathematical co context raise your hands again? Try to call someone who's, who wasn't in my class. Okay, so let me just describe with this description of phase. I think the physical context that I want you to think about. So um, the context I want you to think about is on oscillation, something periodic happening. So you've seen mass on a spring, right? This is oscillation, something periodic. And this is the context where we define the word phase. And the concept of phase is useful for referring to different parts of the cycle. So I can define this cycle. Um, I have some freedom in how I define a cycle. I can choose to start the cycle from here, midpoint. I can choose to start the cycle from the highest point. Or I can choose to start the cycle from the lowest point. Let me make it easy for myself and choose the starting point as the highest point. So when I let go, this is the very beginning po point of the cycle. And you know what one cycle looks like. It's all the way to the bottom and up. That's one cycle, right? So I could say that whenever it does that one full complete thing, that's one cycle. But I want to refer to it with more precision than that. What if I want to refer to half a cycle? Like at which point is it? At the bottom, right? And I can also refer to quarter of a cycle. That would be you know, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and then all four quarters. So, um, so the, the concept of phase arises from trying to describe that the, those different points of a cycle. So when you look at the phase of this oscillation, so each time it comes up to this point, each time it's at the same point on the cycle, it would have the same phase. Uh, this becomes a little bit more precise when you think about the mathematical description of this oscillation. The math, so um, when you look at, I guess, let me just call it, definition of phase. So when you are looking at um, an example of oscillation, and when you want to describe the motion of oscillation mathematically, then what you use is um, you describe the height of a mass as a function of time. And it's going to have this form, some amplitude times. And the way I was describing it as cosine of omega t. So that at the very beginning of a cycle, or at the very beginning of anything, when t is equal to 0, it's uh, at the highest point. And as time goes on, it starts by going downward, and then reaches the most uh, negative point at some point comes back and comes back to the highest point all again. Good? Everyone recognizes this as the, um, as the, the mathematical <laughs> description of oscillation. So what we refer to as a phase is this. It's uh, this part that we are referring to as a phase. It's the argument to this uh, trigonometric function. So, um, so when we measure phase or when we describe phase, it's going to have a unit of angle. So you can describe phase in terms of angular units, like 0 degree phase, 90 degree phase, 180 degree phase. 180 degree phase is what we call, when we talk about phase difference, that's what we call um, out of phase. And so, so this is what phase is. It's a kind of an angle. And if you took physics 4A with me, I might have mentioned at some point, when you are measuring angles, uh, there are two different kinds of angles. There's the phase angle, and there is the physical angle that you measure with the protractor. 
Um, so, um, so pendulum is the most confusing one because they are your, so this is the pendulum. When you look at, when you are trying to describe pendulum motion, you have to keep track of which is phase angle and which is physical angle. If you are looking at physical angle, it's never more than 30 degrees or so. But the phase angle will go all the way from, go all the way from zero to 180 back to, uh, so zero, 180, 360, 720, and so on. <laughs> Good. Okay, so that's, uh, that's phase. Um, and I guess uh, to wrap up the introduction of the word, 10 minutes left. Um, if you've seen the most general form of mathematical description of phase, then you might have seen this form. So what this is, is we call this a phase factor. And the word factor will be, will be a little bit confusing at this point because I'm not multiplying anything. But that's what I want to explain next week when we introduce the complex exponential description. So, the, so we, when someone refers to phase factor, that's what this is. Yeah. So with the phase factor, you can actually sort of change the point at which the change the point at which um, you are deciding to the motion to start occurring. So I said, you know, I just said this as my beginning point, right? At time equals zero, and that's where I got cosine. But with this phase factor, I can shift where my beginning point is. So if I choose to have my initial point of motion be when it's at the midpoint, then I would, um, oh, maybe this should be a minus sign, minus sign. I don't know, I sometimes get confused if it should be plus or minus. So um, then I would have set this phase factor to be 90 degrees. Then if I set it to be 90 degrees, no, 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 it is plus. So, <laughs> okay, so uh, let me, I, I, it's hard to do this with uh, uh, things in my hand, so let me throw it this way. So the way I was describing it originally, it was I have the motion starting from here, and this would be sort of two complete cycles or so, right? And so th the way I had it originally was, this was the point where time was equal to zero. But maybe I don't wanna do that, I want to say time is equal to zero at some other, um, other point in this cycle. And I can control that by changing this phase factor. Uh, so this is when the phase factor phi is equal to zero. But if I say, let's say my phase factor phi is equal to 90 degrees, then think through this. So you start at the cosine of 90 degrees, which is zero, and you add a little bit of time, so that's going to tip it into negative side. So the curve that will look like, it'll look something like this. Um, uh, so 90 degree phase out of phase, it's kind of hard to draw. So this is the curve you would see with a phase factor of 90 degrees. And this, uh, um, this, this uh, idea of phase is useful be because this is a way that we can, we can describe any kind of constructive or destructive interference. So I guess, um, I don't have time to do a lot of this. <laughs> so let me, I, I, I guess, uh, describe this much. I think I have enough time, six minutes to do <laughs> this much. So I have one oscillation. Um, so you could say this is oscillation due to, um, due to some disturbance of some air. And it's happening at um, some, something like this. And let's say I have another source of disturbance. Um, maybe, maybe it's a string that um, there's a source of shaking at one end and there's a source of shaking at the other end and I, I'm looking at the shaking at some particular point. So this is one source of disturbance and the, I have another source of disturbance which has similar description, same amplitude times cosine of omega t and if it's exactly, exactly the same, then that's kind of a special case. If you are trying to describe a more general case, you do that by adding a phase factor. This phase factor is able to 
describe a wide range of different ways of combining two different waves. So, um, so I drew, um, let me color code properly. Let me draw this one in blue. And let me just uh, ask you what the wave should look like if we want the result of their interference, result of their superposition to be destructive. As in, um, so I'm sorry, going a little bit ahead of myself here. So let's say the disturbance due to this source of wave, it looks like this, cosine of omega t. And you guys remember the superposition principle uh, from last time. So superposition principle says if you are looking at um, just the total combined effect of these two disturbances, then the total combined effect will be just the sum of the if in each individual effect. Right? So let's say I want a destructive interference. I want a second source of interference, second source of disturbance, that when I add on top of this, I'm going to get zero. What does that wave look like? Yeah, upside down, right? It's a, not that complicated math. And this one is a little bit easier to draw. <laughs> I can <laughs> make them cross at the same point. So when you add these two together, then the result of that sum, the result of the interference is that those two waves cancel each other out. And this is what we would call destructive interference. Now, here's the question I want you to ask. And this is the reason we started out with the phase. Um, if I want you to specify this second source of disturbance that resulted in destructive interference, what kind of phase, what value of phase factor do I need? Pi? 180 degrees? Yeah, so, it's, so you guys are all giving me angles, which is good, phase is an angle. So you could describe this as pi, or you could describe this as 180 degrees, and that would be one value. If you are looking for more than one value, then each time you add two pi or 360 degrees, you haven't really changed anything. So it'd be this plus two pi times an integer, or this plus 360 degrees times an integer. So, so, um, so with the idea of phase and the phase difference between two sources of disturbance, this is how we can simplify description of conditions for interference. So we can say to get destructive interference, we can say you get destructive interference whenever the difference in the phase is equal to pi or you know, any plus any integer multiple of that, any integer multiple of two pi. Yeah. What if um, I wanted constructive interference? That would be where I add a second wave to it. So let me call that y, uh, y3, where I want to add a, another wave on top of y1, but not y2, and uh, plus V3, what value should V3 be so that I get constructive interference? Zero, right? You want essentially add on top of this the same thing right on top of that. So for the, um, so if you had something that looks like this, then this would result in constructive interference. Constructive interference. And the condition for that, you can also specify with the phase difference again. You can say that to get this, the phase difference is equal to zero is the easy answer. Zero is definitely a valid answer. And like with the last time, you can add any integer multiple of two pi without changing anything. So zero plus two pi n. So, um, so I want to use this as the beginning point. And the, most of the analysis that we'll do, I guess on Tuesday, <laughs> sorry, I'm not able to actually get that far even. I didn't finish section one. Um, the big part of analysis we are going to do is uh, based on some 
um, consideration of the physical setup, what kind of phase difference do you get? So this is what we will start out with on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, this is the picture we'll consider. You can say that you have a screen here, or you have some place where you are going to look at the intensity pattern of light, like this whiteboard earlier in the class. And what you are going to say is you have two sources of light. You have, essentially, um, normally the way you do it is, you know, you have some light that's coming in, and you have, this is the double slit, part of the double slit interference. And you are going to consider this as one source of light, and this is another source of light. And when you look at one particular point here, the light that's coming from one arriving here, light that's coming from the other arriving here, they will be slightly different. Um, the overall distance is not that different. We assume the screen is very far away, and the overall distance, the difference is very small difference. But what matters is that when you sort of look at this like a long isosceles triangle, there's a very small difference in the path length. And this very small difference in the path length leads to the small difference in, or it leads to a difference in phase. And we are going to impose this condition of um, if that phase is this, then if the phase difference is this, then we get destructive interference, you get those dark fringes. If the phase difference is this, then you get constructive interference and you get those bright fringes. Okay? So if we had a, you know, five, 10 more minutes, we would work through this, but we'll start out, the, uh, start out with that on Tuesday.